uh, one stop solution i would say for the healthcare professionals who would like to migrate in australia and uh, so far it is uh, you know hit by uh, sir uh, welcome you again once again sir uh, so uh, dr Adam, he himself has done his phd uh, from university of sydney and over the past 10 years he is into this research industry and teaching and help already helped numerous lives and helped them to settle down in abroad. Uh, sir, uh, over to you, you can just, you know. Uh, yeah. Okay, guys. Hi, everyone. So I think you know about me. So my name is Dr. Akram Ahmed. So I'm basically Indian pharmacist. And uh, I did my bachelor degree master from India. Then I moved to Malaysia where I work around four years of uh, teaching clinical pharmacy. In our last six years, I'm living and working in Australia. So at academically, we are providing the assistance for all healthcare professionals like medical doctor, dentist, pharmacist, physiotherapist, nurses, optometrists, veterinary doctors. So anyone looking to migrate to Australia or any other country, US, Canada, we provide the assistance here to that, like document verification will help you and we'll provide the coaching for you to pass the exam from your home country. And then easily you can migrate. So this is how we up, uh, yeah, and today's history is a kind of like, you know, how we are going to uh, prepare for you for this exam. Like live class we take, and we uh, provide the study material. We also provide the mock test based on the each module. And we have a lot of grant tests as well for this APC. Uh, 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 yeah, Thank you, Choni. And I will talk to you. If you have any questions, you can ask. We will uh, take the question at the end of this uh, uh, I mean, at uh, the end of this uh, lecture. So we have around 90% student pass so far from academically. We have a lot of student pass this exam, and now they are practicing um, in Australia. And yeah, uh, we can say around more than 60 countries students joined academically in the last two years. And we have a very extremely qualified faculty for all these programs. And we have taken a lot of time to create this content for you and make sure to pass in your first attempt. Uh, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you thank for setting you. up the background. Uh, so we have Dr. Ishwarya, and she is one of our faculties who is uh, taking up the class for our APC accidents. And uh, today she will be delivering a small topic. Uh, so we'll request your support, and please be responsive and engaging uh, during your session. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, am I audible? Sure. I'll help you out now. Yes, ma'am, you are audible. I'll help you out with the presentation then. Okay. Okay. Oh, happy morning to everyone present here. So, uh, thank you so much, Akram sir, and uh, academically for the uh, wonderful opportunity. It's always been happy to work here. And uh, dear participants, you'll be having a lot of queries regarding the APC exam. So, uh, after this master class, uh, you can raise your queries and uh, we'll be there to help you out in uh, uh, clearing the examination as well as uh, the other questions that you're on to. Uh, ma'am, shall I go ahead with the session? Please, ma'am. So today's topic will be uh, onto the assessment of the pulmonary system. So we, ha we have framed a uh, the curriculum uh, that are on to the APC standard as well. So we thought we can have a discussion on to this topic today. So uh, regarding cardiorespiratory uh, system, uh, it is actually divided into two components, cardiac and respiratory system. So today we'll be dealing with the assessment of the respiratory system. Uh, uh, you all will be knowing the topic is very vast. So just for the time concerned and other things, I have just cut short the topic into various components. So in the live class, we'll be dealing everything in the uh, in a detailed manner as well. OK, so regarding with the assessment, the first uh, uh, thing is the, um, the general observation. Today, we'll be seeing only the objective assessment. So the subjective assessment and all, you'll be knowing very well. So I'm not going into that. So the objective assessment includes your um, uh, begins with the conscious level as well. So you'll assess the conscious level of the patient. And then, um, then you will uh, observe the patient, like whether he is having any shortness of breath or whether he's what is the position of the patient, 
and uh, is he on any supplemental oxygen therapy so by mere observation or you can have a conversation with the patient whether he is able to speak a few words or he is having great difficulty in speaking so all these things will give you a clue about the level of distress he is actually having so next is you have to observe the level of consciousness so a patient who is having a reduction in conscious level they are at a risk of aspiration and retention of secretions so when you are when you are seeing a patient with a reduction in conscious level so your work as a, a physiotherapist on the rehabilitation will be more then you all know we assess the conscious level using a gcs uh, scale that is glasgow coma scale so the a minimum score for that is 3 out of 15 so you will be assessing the eye opening component uh, verbal response and the motor response so uh, this eye opening component uh, the highest score will be 4 and the verbal response will be 5 and the motor response will be 6 so add everything the maximum score that will give you a 15 so out of 15 whatever the patient is scoring you will grade the patient's conscious level next slide ma'am so next you will go ahead with the vital assessment so the temperature uh, temperature blood pressure heart rate and the respiratory rate you will be assessing so first will be the uh, temperature so temperature it is again uh, can measure it in a number of ways so it is oral oral uh, axillary or rectal component like if you don't have access to any of the areas above you can use the other areas for assessing the temperature and uh, so one common point is uh, this oral temperature when you are measuring the temperature at the level of mouth uh, it is actually the most convenient method but still it must not be performed uh, for the people who smoke after a period of 15 minutes so for the smokers you have to leave a time gap of 15 minutes um, or when the person has had any hot or cold food you have to give a time frame of 15 minutes after which you have to do the temperature or else you will be landing into false interpretation of the result then you all know the body temperature is around 36.5 to 37.5 degrees celsius so the temperature will be lowest in the early morning and highest in the afternoon so you have to um, note down the duration at which you are uh, checking the temperature then uh, next is heart rate heart rate is actually measured best at the uh, uh, cardiac apex and uh, you can feel the uh, pulse at the level of the arteries like carotid radial or uh, femoral artery so next is uh, okay so you have something known as heart rate so heart rate is actually at the uh, at the level i mean the heart rate is at the level of apex and this pulse rate is at the level of your carotid and the radial and femoral artery so the difference between the two is known as the pulse deficit okay so when you have a difference between the two that is known as pulse deficit so what does it indicate like some of the heart beats uh, might not have caused a sufficient blood flow to reach the peripheral level okay so there is no sufficient blood flow so that can be missed by the heart beat levels as well so this type is actually seen in patients with arrhythmia okay so arrhythmia is an abnormal rhythm of the heart so people who who are having arrhythmia so they have this kind of a uh, pulse deficit so in questions you can be asked like the person demonstrated a pulse deficit so you'll be able to this will give you a clue so they are talking about arrhythmia so just one simple example then next is blood pressure so again it is normal varies from 95 by 60 to 140 mm by 90 mm hg so hypertension it is um, so you have hyper and hypotension then you have postural hypotension that is drop in the blood pressure greater than 5 mm during lying and sitting then pulses paradoxes it is again uh, you have a drop in the blood pressure greater than 10 mm of mercury so when there is a deficit difference in this it can denote a person might be having an airway obstruction next slide ma'am so next is a respiratory rate respiratory rate it is number of breaths per minute so it is 12 by 16 so normal is 12 by 16 and tachypnea it is greater than 20 and bradypnea it is less than 10 uh, breaths per minute so people who are having obstructive lung diseases 
in them the work of breathing will be more so the use of accessory muscles will be increased hence their respiratory rate will be increased so people who are having distress and severe obstructive lung diseases they demonstrate a higher respiratory rate then next is the cyanosis so a cyanosis is a again a pathological condition this bluish discoloration of the skin and the mucous membrane next slide ma'am you have two types central and peripheral cyanosis central cyanosis is a one in which the um, there is a drop in the uh, level of the deoxygenated hemoglobin so it is um it is always above 5 g per deciliter and oxygen saturation will go for a drop it is 85% and less then peripheral cyanosis it is again seen in the uh, peripheral aspect that is upper and lower extremity when there is a reduction in the blood flow so central cyanosis is very well appreciated over the uh, the mouth and the mucous membrane peripheral will be seen at the extremities so i have shown a difference between the two central and peripheral so central the common mechanism is arterial desaturation then peripheral cyanosis it is increased peripheral utilization then sites it is skin mucous membrane and oral cavity and here it is only the skin that is peripheral aspect temperature um, it will be warm and here it is cold and clammy skin because you don't have blood supply at the end so the limbs become very cold then clubbing it is again present in the case of central cyanosis and peripheral you don't have a clubbing secondary erythrocytosis again present and here it is absent then on warming when you warm the tissues the cyanosis will be the same in the case of central but whereas the reduction will happen when there is a uh, in in the peripheral cyanosis then again oxygen therapy so the if you if the person is having a cyanosis that is due to a respiratory component then the oxygen therapy will actually improve the central cyanosis but here you don't have, again in this uh in peripheral cyanosis again your cyanosis will reduce then exercise cyanosis will worsen in the case of central and it is same or improves in the case of peripheral abg again central cyanosis the po2 will be low and here the po2 will be normal so next slide so next is a clubbing so clubbing is there is a uh, the loss of the nail bed angulation so so the angle becomes distorted and the uh, fingers will assume a shape of a drumstick appearance so just by observing the patient you can mere observing this sign the uh, uh, the clubbing will be evident so when you bring both the fingers you approximate both the index fingers together you normally you will have a gap in between both the fingers as well so you have a gap between the nail beds but here it is this i mean this is actually normal so can you see the gap in between so in patients with clubbing the nail bed angulation will go off and you don't be able to find a this minimal gap also next slide ma'am so these are the causes for clubbing so it is a mnemonic so from the clubbing name itself you can find out the obvious cause so c for cardiac so any kind of cardiac subacute infective endocarditis a cyanotic heart disease and atrial atrial myxoma then l for lungs lung abscess empyema cystic fibrosis idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis tuberculosis bronchiectasis mesothelioma everything then u for ulcerative colitis v for uh, biliary cirrhosis again b for bronchogenic carcinoma i for idiopathic and n it is not copd and g for gastrointestinal malabsorption so any kind of gi diseases again they can produce clubbing next slide ma'am so these are the grading of clubbing so 1 2 and 3 and 4 one you have a normal appearance and the angle but you can increase fluctuancy of the nail bed so this area and next what happens uh loss of nail angle between the nail and the nail bed so here you can visualize but in this there is a loss and stage 3 it is increased curvature of the nail and fourth stage it is expansion of the terminal phalanx giving a drumstick appearance so this is stage 4 next slide ma'am so next we'll be uh, moving on to the investigatory part so common investigations regard with regards to pulmonary uh, system will be your um, chest x ray then your abg pft and other things so we'll see the important components alone 
So in chest X-ray, what you need to look in for? So first thing, uh, patient's name, age, gender, the region of X-ray, and date and time on which the X-ray was taken. So the first two points you will be uh, knowing the reason as well. Then the last point it is to uh, suppose you are giving any treatment. So after a, a chest X-ray again, you can find out whether the patient's condition has improved or not. Just to go for a follow-up and uh, your assessment, you can you need to note the date and time on which the X-ray was taken. Next slide, ma'am. Yeah. So you have the uh, two types of views, PA and the AP views. So first you have to assess the image quality. So if the quality is, is not proper, then that can lead to false interpretation of results as well. So we follow this mnemonics known as RIPE. So R-I-P-E. So R stands for rotation, I stands for inspiration, and P stands for projection, and E stands for exposure. So I repeat, it is rotation, inspiration, projection, and exposure. So uh, how will you assess for rotation? So sometimes during the um, X-ray, like X so exposure, the person might not have um, maintained a proper position. So sometimes rotation of the trunk can lead to false interpretation. So how will you find whether the person has rotated? You will be looking in for the uh, equidistant clavicle position. So make sure both the clavicle levels are on the same level. And the spinous process uh, of the vertebrae will be in vertical alignment. So if they are, uh, if these two parameters are not proper, then um, it shows the person must have gone for a rotation. Again, you have to redo the X-ray again. Then inspiration. So all X-rays are done with a full inhalation procedure. So during, so if that is the scenario, if that was done in a proper manner, then you'll be able to visualize the uh, five to six ribs, then the apex of the lung and the cause of phrenic angle. So the angle between the ribs and the diaphragm. So those angles. I'll show those things in detail in the next slide. Okay. So next is the projection. Projection is the AP or the PA view. So I've given the difference between the two. So AP, uh, it is the scapula will be directly over the lung fields. And clavicles are above the apex of the lung. Then anterior ribs are distinct. PA, it is the other way now. In the posterior anterior, scapula will be periphery. And the clavicles will project over the lung fields. So can you see in this um, slide as well? So the scapulas are more periphery. But can you see here? It is more, it is directly over the lung fields. So here it is located far. Then uh, the posterior ribs are distinct in the case of PA. But whereas in AP, the anterior ribs will be distinct. So this is the right format. Then you have to, um, for the interpretation, you have to go ahead with the A, B, C, D approach. Ma'am, next slide, please. OK, so you'll be looking into the airway. So airway component, first you will look in for the tracheal deviation. So the trachea always has to be in midline. In certain pathological conditions, you will have a shift in the trachea. So either to the right or to the left. So tracheal deviation, it is of two types. Ma'am, next slide. Yes. So you have true and apparent uh, deviation. So true is the pushing of trachea or pulling of trachea. So pushing of trachea, like trachea will be pushed. So it happens in the case of a, a pneumothorax or a pleural effusion. On the other side, when there is a pulling of trachea, OK, so trachea will be pulled towards this one side. So pulling is always due to consolidation. Then apparent tracheal deviation it is always seen when the patient has gone for a rotation. OK, so the true tracheal deviation is the one you must be really concerned about. Next slide, please. So next is the, um, we'll be going for the cardiomegaly. So, so what do you mean by cardiomegaly? It is uh, increase in the size of the heart or enlargement of the heart. So cardio means heart, megaly means an increase in size. So you, how will you find out whether there is cardiomegaly? So you'll be looking in for a ratio known as cardiothoracic ratio. 
So what is cardiothoracic ratio? It is simply the, the distance from the heart shadow to the ratio of the distance from the thoracic diameter. So you divide these two values, your, your answer should be somewhere between 0.4 to 0.5. Okay, so this is a normal value. If you have a value which is greater than 0.5, then there is sure an increase in the size of the heart or cardiomegaly. Next slide, ma'am. And next is a diaphragm. So you will be looking in for the diaphragm. So the dome of the diaphragm should be very well visible. Okay, so this side. So you must be both the right and left hemidiaphragm. It must be at the same level. So next slide, ma'am. So you can assess this by doing a costophrenic angle assessment. So you have an angle between the, the ribs and the diaphragm. So this is the arch of the diaphragm or dome of the diaphragm. So this angle is known as a costophrenic angle. So in this x-ray, this side that is on the right side, the angle is very well visible. But on the left side, there is loss of costophrenic angle or costophrenic blunting. So when there is a loss or a blunt, so it can indicate a presence of fluid or a consolidation in that particular area. Then again, this can also happen as a result of lung hyperinflation in the case of a patient with COPD. Okay, so in COPD, they have a gross hyperinflation that is not on the milder category when the disease is progressing. So again, when there is a hyperinflation, there will be obvious loss of this angulation as well. So next slide, ma'am. And this is next is atelectasis, that is collapse of a particular lobe. So for the uh, reference, I've just given middle lobe atelectasis alone. So in middle lobe atelectasis, we have shown a frontal radiograph and we have shown a lateral radiograph. So how can you find out whether there is atelectasis? So so very uh, common first finding is there will be a shifting in the fissure, oblique fissure. When you go for the lateral uh, x-ray, there will be a shift in the oblique fissure as well. So this indicates there is a, a collapse of a particular lobe as well. So as of now, I have just given the middle lobe reference alone. Next slide, ma'am. This is a, another thing we have to know. This is a sillhout sign. So sillhout sign, it is primarily used to localize the lung lesion. Okay, so when you're not sure where is the exact location of a lesion, this identification of sillhout sign will give you a clue. So what happens, each lobe or of a lung will correspond to a particular outline or an anatomical structure. Just have like this in mind. So I've just given the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So 1 is the blue line. So that corresponds to the right upper lobe. OK, so right upper lobe, it is equivalent with the right paratracheal stripe. So adjacent to the trachea, the so right paratracheal stripe will denote the right upper lobe region. So in x-rays, when you have a loss of this right paratracheal stripe, that will give you an indirect clue whether the right upper lobe is affected or not. OK, so this will give you a clue. Like there is some pathologies there in the upper lobe, right upper lobe. Again, you have to go ahead and correlate with the other findings as well. Next is uh, this purple one that is left upper lobe. It corresponds to the aortic arch. And then right middle lobe, that is pink one, it corresponds to the right heart border. And left heart border corresponds to the lingular segment. And the right hemidiaphragm corresponds to the right lower lobe, and left hemidiaphragm corresponds to the left lower lobe. So loss of these structures or outline will give you a clue that corresponding lobe is affected. Next slide, ma'am. So this we are done with the chest x-ray. Next is the ABG component, that is arterial blood gas analysis. Again, ABG is yet another important uh, investigation that will help you in uh, uh, the assessment as well as in the prognosis of a patient as well. So what is uh, it aids in the diagnosis, then guides treatment plan, aids in ventilator management, 
improvement in acid base management allows optimal function of medications then the status may alter electrolyte levels critical to patient status next slide ma'am okay so these are the normal values on the abg so ph will be 7.3 to 7.4 pco2 will be 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury po2 will be 75 to 100 millimeters of mercury hco3 will be 22 to 26 milli equivalents per liter and oxygen saturation will be greater than 95 next slide ma'am okay so how will you find out whether or how will you read an abg report so first one, you have to just follow these three points. So one and two and three. First one, you have to find out whether there is acidosis or alkalosis. Uh, that can be very well found out by looking at the pH value. Okay, when the pH is going for a reduction, it is termed as acidosis. When the pH is going for an increase, it is alkalosis. Okay, next is metabolic or respiratory component which is involved that you have to find out so when you have an uh, alteration in the uh, P, uh, PACO2 then uh, that shows your respiratory component is involved when you have an alteration in the bicarbonate level then that shows your metabolic component is involved so what do you mean by respiratory component it is purely with the lung issue as well metabolic means you can have an alteration with regards to the organ pathology your renal system okay so or your other organ pathologies can have a role in the functioning alt uh, or alteration of the abg as well next you have to find out whether it is fully compensated partially compensated or uncompensated we'll see all those things in the following slides next slide ma'am okay so you have to follow this tic-tac-toe method very simple so just have this uh, squares nine squares okay so in the middle it is normal and on either sides it is acidosis and alkalosis so you will mention you will just in um, add your values accordingly suppose if your ph is normal then under normal you will write uh, your normal ph if it is acidosis so under acidosis what is the value or if it is alkalosis what is the value will be entering then again pacvo2 value if it is less than 35 then you term it as alkalosis and if it is greater than 45 it is acidosis and with the bicarbonates it is the other way around if the bicarbonate level is very less less than 22 then it is acidosis greater than 26 it is alkalosis so we'll enter all the values accordingly okay so uh with regards to the compensation how will you find out so in the case of a fully compensated abg so your ph will be normal but whereas you have alterations in the other values but whereas in partially compensated uh, abg you have abnormality in all the values as well in the case of an uncompensated in the case of an uncompensated uh, abg you will have a normal value of the pacvo2 or a hco3 okay either of them will be normal the other is abnormal if one is normal the other will be abnormal okay so this is how you will interpret an abg and uh, you will find out whether it is fully compensated partially or uncompensated next slide ma'am so next going on to auscultation this is uh just given the, the parts alone next slide ma'am so this is how you will auscult it these are the areas so you have just four areas above clavicle then second intercostal space fourth and sixth intercostal space so you start on the right side above clavicle you will auscultate the apex then you'll go to the left side then continue on the left side just go to the second intercostal space and then that is immediately adjacent to the sternum then to the second intercostal space on the right then fourth intercostal space on the right and fourth intercostal space on the left then sixth intercostal space at the level of mid axillary line on the left and sixth intercostal space at the mid axillary line on the right so you just follow this 
S shaped pattern. You have to compare with both the sides. So next slide, ma'am. So this is these are the various types of uh, red sounds. So we have tracheal sounds, bronchovesicular, and a vesicular pattern. Next slide, ma'am. So just given the tabular column. So tracheal sound. So your so the line which is going up that is the inspiratory component, and the line which is going down is the expiratory component. So what is the ratio? So in tracheal sound, your inspiratory and expiratory sounds are equal. So where is the position to of the stethoscope? It is directly over the trachea, that is immediately above the um, supraclavicular notch as well. So it is very loud and it is high pitch quality. The next is a bronchial sound. Bronchial, it is you have a shorter inspiratory phase and a longer expiratory phase. So that is what they have given in the diagram. So bronchial sounds, it is directly over the manubrium sternum. So immediately over the manubrium, just above the clavicle. Then bronchovesicular, it is uh, you have equal in both the uh, phases. And it is heard at the level of the first and second intercostal sphere next to the sternum, that is anteriorly, and on the posteriorly between the scapulae. The last one is a vesicular sound. You have a greater inspiratory component and a lesser exhalatory component. It is heard in almost all of the lung fields as well. These are normal breath sounds. Next slide, ma'am. So next is the PFT. So the pulmonary function test, this is again an important one. Uh, this will help you to find out whether the person is coming under the obstructive category or a restrictive category. So this is one important investigation you must be knowing. So next slide, ma'am. So what are the contraindications? So before going into that, we must know what are the contraindications. So acute disorders which affects the performance. Person is having any nausea or vomiting or any vertigo. So he won't be able to uh, take up this test fully. So they are contraindicated. So what is the procedure that is done? The person uh, will be asked to do in a deep inhalation. Then his nose will be clipped. And he'll be given a mouthpiece. And he has to just blow out into the mouthpiece. So how much he's able to blow. So the duration, everything will be recorded on the device. And the graph will be plotted accordingly. So based on the shape of the graph and the values that is obtained, um you can frame out uh, a conclusion what type of disorder is actually so next is hemoptysis of unknown origin that is coughing up of blood again uh, this maneuver because they are doing a forced expiratory maneuver this can aggravate the underlying condition next is a pneumothorax um recent abdominal or thoracic surgery then recent eye surgery so this can increase the ocular pressure then recent MI or unstable angina, thoracic aneurysm. So aneurysm is an abnormal dilatation of the blood vessel as well. So this extreme pressure can lead to rupture of the aneurysm. So because of these um, scenarios, we are avoiding uh, spirometry for this population as well. Next slide, ma'am. So when there is an obstructive pattern, what and all, you'll be able to find out. So we'll be getting two types of values. FEV1 and FVC. What is FEV1? It is forced expiratory volume at the first second. Then FVC, it is forced vital capacity. So it is always less than the uh, lower limits. So what is lower limits? From the normal value, you have to reduce 10. So that is a, so if you reduce 10, so the values will be till then less than LLN. So that is what they have given. So normal FEV1 by FVC is always the value will be around 70% the ratio. So normal will be 70. So in this, they will have a value lesser than 70 percentage. OK, so next slide, ma'am. So we'll have a curve accordingly. So this is a flow volume loop. So in this, they have given the values. And this is a flow volume loop. So this phase, the above one, and this is the below one. So, so above this smaller curve, can you see a bigger curve? You can zoom and see. So this is a normal range. 
So here the person is having a lesser value. So the curve is very short and you will have a scooped out appearance of a curve. So here it is full and here a portion of the curve has been cut out. So it looks like that the scooped out appearance of the curve is seen in the case of an obstructive lung disease. Next slide, ma'am. A restrictive pattern, again, um, when the person is having any kind of congenital skeletal deformities and other things, there will be a restrictive pattern. So in this, you don't have any a difference in this values as well. Okay, so it will be almost normal. And next slide, ma'am. So here, Next slide, ma'am. OK, go to the previous slide. Ma so in this restrictive pattern, you will have a witch hat appearance of the curve. So on obstructive pattern, you will have a scooped out appearance pattern of the curve. In restrictive, you will have a witch hat appearance of the curve as well. Next slide, ma'am. So this is yet another uh, test you must be knowing. So bronchodilator challenge test. So this test will help uh, earlier, um, like when I was doing my graduation, like undergraduation, like we were like this asthma, no, this um, under uh, obstructive lung disease, we studied chronic bronchitis, emphysema, asthma. Everything was under obstructive lung disease. Then um, this asthma is actually uh, received a special attention. So now asthma is coming under a separate category. So it is coming under, again, it is the same obstructive lung disease. It is coming under reversible obstructive lung disease. So the chronic bronchitis and emphysema, they come under irreversible obstructive lung disease. But this comes under reversible obstructive lung disease. Meaning, so when you give a bronchodilator, you can have a reversal in the symptoms as well. So what we do, so when a person is coming with obstructive uh, symptoms, so we do the same PFT using a bronchodilator challenge. So the first, uh, first test will be the routine spirometry. The next test will be the person will be given a bronchodilator, okay, any form of short-acting bron bronchodilator. So that is 200 ml will be given. So usually albutrol, salbutamol, all these kind of drugs will be given. So the person will be given 10 minutes after the administration of the drug. So after bronchodilator installation, then a re-PFT will be done or a re-spirometry will be done. So what happens here is there will be an improvement in the values. So initially, there will be a drop in the FEV1 by FEC. After bronchodilator administration, there will be an increase in the bronchodilator to around 12%. So this shows the person is having a reversible obstructive lung disease, meaning the person's uh, symptoms can be treated by giving a bronchodilator. Example is the asthma. So next slide, ma'am. So I've shown the curve also. See, so this is, so this is the actual curve. So the inner one, that is a green one, is the very first value. So. Then after giving bronchodilator, can you see the outer curve, the bigger one? There is an improvisation in the values. So this one is the axillary component, and the below, the below y-axis will be the x-axis will be the inspiratory component. So here there is an improvement in the value. Next slide, ma'am. So this is the normal uh, flow volume curve and a graph. So this is the peak expiratory flow, the above value. This is the peak, this is the inspiratory uh, curve. So this will give the vital capacity and other values. This is again used to measure the FEV1. Next slide, ma'am. OK, so with this, uh, we are done with the presentation. So I've given some questions. If possible, uh, you can just try to solve this. So you can just add the answers in the chat box. So what is the normal respiratory rate?
Okay, so yeah, most of them have given the right answer. It is 14 to 18 breaths per minute. Next, next slide, ma'am. So this question, breathing that takes place normally in the lungs are which one? Vesicular or bronchial? So, vesicular, the another term for vesicular is organ. Okay, another meaning for vesicular is organ. And bronchial, it is the bronchus as well. So, we are talking about the lungs. So, it is always vesicular. So, many of them have given the right answer except a few. So, you can just uh, make a note. You have given the wrong answer. Okay, next slide, ma'am. Yeah, interpret this ABG report. So pH is 7.44, PaCO2 is 30, and HCO3 is 21. So how will you interpret this ABG? So you have to give me the answer along with the compensatory aspect as well. And which component, respiratory or metabolic? You have to give that way. Which component is involved? And what is the compensation? Riti Sachdeva, you haven't given the component. Pavlin Kaur, you have just uh, given the component alone, but not the compensatory part. Yes, now we are giving. <clears throat> OK. So it is uh, what is happening to the pH? pH value is more or less? You can unmute an answer. What is for other people who can't understand, like who are having difficulty in uh, interpreting this? So what is the pH value here? 7.44. So it is high, right? So it is on the alkalotic side. OK. No, no, no. Bisma, your pH is not normal. PH is actually on the alkalotic side. Then what is PaCO2? It is less than 35. So it is alkalosis. OK. Then uh, what is your bicarbonate level? Bicarbonate level, it is less than 22. Again, it is going for the acidosis. So apply the tic-tac-toe method. So what happens in? in this type of an interpretation. So you will have the uh, respiratory component, respiratory alkalosis, and the fully compensated ABG. OK, so the answer for this is a respiratory alkalosis and the fully compensated ABG. So most of them have given a the correct answer as well. OK, so really good job you have done. So this is a simple example I have given. So in the exams, you will be having uh, the combination of everything. OK, so with this, I'm done with my session. 
So over to you, Shohini, ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the academic session. But if you could just guide on the exam pattern and uh, you know the steps to be followed, that would be really helpful. And sir can yes. also support. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. So yes, ma'am. So what is this uh, APC exam? So it is a um, Australian Physiotherapy Council exam. So a primary uh, license to uh, to become a registered physiotherapist and you have to practice in Australia, you have to clear this exam as well. So what we do, we actually uh, train people um, to clear this exam. So we'll be working on all the components as well. So we will, I mean, we, the curriculum as such, they have given a lot of components. So we have framed the syllabus accordingly. So uh, you'll be having a lot of live sessions. So covering each topic as well. So when I was doing the session, no, I saw a chat message like we'll be covering only cardiopulmonary. It is not so. We will give equal importance to MSK, neuro, and cardiopulmonary as well. Added to this, we have certain other additions also that also will be dealt by us during the class sessions as well okay so what about the abc exam it is to practice as a therapist in australia it is mandatory to clear this exam and um, you have uh, so we have this uh, separate assessment you'll be writing the uh, the written component and then you have to go for a clinical assessment component so in the written component so you can take the exam at your own place and uh, for the clinical component you have to uh, go to australia and you have to uh, enter their simulation lab and you have to take up the exam for the clinical component otherwise known as practical examination so the ap next so who and all are eligible so the candidate must be an internationally trained physiotherapist with a minimum diploma level qualification so a simple ug level degree is mandatory so he must hold the uh, education uh, I, I will take care here from you thank you so much okay uh, okay sir yeah. This is Dr. Akram here. So the eligibility to sit in this exam for APC or Skin Free Therapy Council exam, you must need to have at least four years bachelor degree. Okay. And you must be a registered uh, free therapist in your home country. So these are the two basic conditions to sit in this exam. Yes, Shoni, can you please next? And this is an online exam. So there is no need to go to any exam center. You can give this exam from your home. Okay. And we will provide you with the around 14 week, 3.5 month live classes for this. We provide the stream material. Plus you will take a lot of mock tests based on the individual uh, module. Uh, okay. And then we also have a lot of the uh, final grant tests as well. And we provide one-on-one -on -one support. If you have any questions, you can ask directly to the lecture. We provide live session, live class. Okay, so you can ask as many doubts you have, or if you miss, in that case, you will get the recorded session. And also, you can ask at any time in our Discord platform, in the community platform. So you can ask anytime if you have doubt, and our faculty will reply to you there. You know, and we have around 2,000 um, and this uh, previous question papers. So on that, you have to practice. So most of the time, the questions, some questions might be repeat, or the other questions might be in the same uh, format or same concept uh, uh, you will receive in the, those questions. OK, Shwani, next, please. Yeah, so there's basically uh, in the free therapy, paper one and paper two. So basically, in Australia, if you, in order to migrate to Australia, there is some steps you need to complete. The first step called document verification in general. So we will help you to complete this process. Then after that, you need to write this APC written assessment exam. This is a multiple choice case basis exam. And you can give this exam from your home country. We are providing the coaching for this exam for you. Okay. In the paper one, basically, there will be, be around uh, 90 questions and 30 questions and out of that based on the uh, case based scenarios they will give the uh, mcqs multiple questions and 60 is a general choice questions so 90 questions 
and uh, yeah uh, this is a, uh, in this uh, part one and part two is the OSCE exam or we can say the clinical exam and you need to be in Australia to write ex that exam yes Shwani, can you please yeah so I think mentioned that there is a uh, steps first step document verification with Australian free therapy council no need to worry we will help you to complete that process then going forward we will provide you the coaching for this exam this part one exam so you need to pass from your home country and then also you need to pass the english test okay for example uh, this uh, uh, ielts or pt you need to give and we will provide you the coaching for this exam for this english as well okay and then after you complete this three step then you need to come to australia to write this uh, part two Okay, so you can contact us on this is our phone number and we have this WhatsApp number so directly you can connect with me. So if you have any question, you can just WhatsApp on these two numbers. Even you can email us or you can go the more information, go to academy.com. There is a lot of blogs we have write about this pre therapy council exam. So you can go and have a look there. And we have basically a separate channel for free therapists. So if you are a free therapist looking to market Australia, any other country so we make a lot of content on youtube this is the name academically dot uh, mad care dot uh, this is the new channel academically dot mad care okay the dedicated channel for uh, nursing professionals and free therapists so now i can take some of your questions so if you can just uh, unmute yourself one by one hi basma Yes, Payal Agrawal. Please unmute one by one, or then you can ask the question. Yes, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, I want to know uh, what will be our fees for documentation process? Yes, the, this will, our, our team will give you the information. I think they also missed, there is one slide on this. We also provide, the, we have a, a scholarship right now, the ongoing for APC exam. Uh, preparation course and also we provide the loan facilities so you can pay our fees in six months nine months 12 months without paying any additional interest uh, 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 for on that fees okay so please just we just need to connect to our team and they will give you uh, apart from fees if you have any specific questions to me you can discuss this fee yes part sir one more question there is i have one more question Yes, yes. So if we uh, uh, if we have cleared this uh, license exam from our hometown, so uh, how we will move to Australia via work you or to, no? Uh, you have to go in general basically on the visit visa to come Australia to write that uh, part two exam, or you have if you have any other visa or work visa or maybe if you, you have like kind of like you know study visa whatever. So these are the, some of the options for you to come Australia to uh, complete your uh, clinical exam. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, Tamina Begum, can you please unmute? Or Ariba Khatri? Yes, Musharraf Nadi, Vijay Shri, please unmute. Uh, good good afternoon sir good afternoon sir i'm asking regarding the clinical exam which we which is going to conduct it in australia itself uh, i'm asking that if we if we will qualify the written exam in the home country and then we go to australia for practical exam and what if we fail in that exam means you need our... to give one more time if you fail one time two times three times you can repeat as many times you Oh, by staying in Australia itself. Oh. Yes, you stay in Australia or come back and you can go next time, you know. There will be a visa in general, even visit visa they give for one year, for 12 months. But you, you can live maximum three months this year, okay. So if you fail in that, you can, you need to sit in the next time. There are unlimited attempts. Yes, as many times attempt you can take. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, please unmute. Anyone else? 
गुड इवनिंग सर यस गुड इवनिंग यमिना सर करंटली आई एम इन न्यूजीलैंड सर आई हैव गॉट ग्रेजुएटेड इन इंडिया ओनली okay um so i'm having a doubt that, that uh, you uh, just i gone through all the portal like what are all the coaching and everything sir. so what about the timings of the classes it is going to be a group session or like individual session are you able to pay the australian fees in in a per hour basis as no 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 <laughs> not like that uh, <laughs> no, this, because of if the a, coaching if the coaching, coaching me that there is a class 10 15 20 students Yes, yes, sir. Twenty student, minimum ten student in the class. Okay. So okay. We, we take basically in general uh, uh, Sydney time around eight to ten p.m. But this uh, we may change little bit, you know. So we we will see the student join from what are the countries. So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we will, okay, sir. We will talk to the student and uh, as per all student if they agree, you know, then we we'll okay. decide. But in general, because our faculty, some of the faculty is in Australia, right? So okay, we, okay, we start okay. Start in the evening time. Yeah, I can say eight to ten Sydney time. Okay, okay. Because uh, when I thought the lecturer is from India, maybe no, no, it I would be like an Indian time or anything like that. There is like a faculty from Australia as well. Two okay, faculty okay. from Australia as well. APC qualified. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So we have around four faculty for this course right now. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, uh, Gulista Fatima, can you please unmute? And we are giving this yeah, link yeah. in in our chat box. This is our pages. You can follow up on Instagram for this Mad Care or Mad Care on YouTube also. And please fill this form in the chat box. So we also ask you your uh, feedback. So you can write in you know, how we can improve. Or if you have any specific question, please ask. in that form our team will get uh, get in touch with you uh, um, very soon okay or maybe you can mm -hmm. also give us your phone number email us yes please sir good afternoon sir good afternoon uh, sir i want to know if, if there is any clinical experience we have to add for that exam there is no much work experience required but if you have experience that is uh, good for you okay sir thank you thank you from government side no work experience required but if you have any the uh, add on i can say okay. yeah okay thank you sir thank you yes next please or uh, you can type your question in the chat box so i can read the question and can give the answer please fill this form in the chat box or you can basically provide us your info phone number email so we can connect to you after this session please ask doubts you know if you have any yeah thank you so much you are giving good reviews in our chat box or uh, we are on Live also on social media, so I can see if there is any question. Anyone questions? Hello, yes, sir. I have a question. Yes. Yeah, sir, what will be, what will be the cost of your uh, total course? this will you leave your phone number email in the chat box our team will connect you the cost basically there is step by step process first step okay. then exam then english you know so step yeah. by step they will give you the breakdown or regarding the fees okay actually i i want to know the uh, whole package what will uh, it going to be cost whole package actually you need to pay the government fees only you know for us you need to pay only our course fees That's yeah. of the fee you need to pay directly to the government. Like for example, yeah, I, I understand that. I uh, that's why I am asking. But if, uh, if you just clear me the cost, then I'll sign. Uh, I'll sign the video. No, no cost is that's why I am saying. The team will give you. So I am not here to tell you the the cost. आप पूछोगे आप लिया मैं प्रोसेस क्या होता है कोई एग्जाम एंड कोई टेक्निकल क्वेश्चन पूछो मेरे से. I am I am the expert for this. I am not for the just for the fees. And then this is our team will give you. We have a 90 employee for the company. Uh, this is for this job for them. 
they will call okay. you back they will give you okay. the fee detail step by okay. step but apart okay, from sir. this personally if you have any question you can ask me apart okay. from fee. But in general, okay. anyone migrating any doctor. Right, sir. I, I get you. I get you, sir. I'll talk to your team then only. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. They will around maybe. Uh, yeah. Okay, guys. Please ask me any, any technical thing. Sir, uh, is there any yes. age limit for giving written examination? But there is no age limit for the to write the exam. But there is an age limit to apply the visa to get the, the PR visa. So your age must be below 45 years of age. Okay, answer one more question. Uh, uh, are there any job option if we clear written exam and not clinical? No, if you are in Australia, obviously you can, you know, uh, you have to find a job. Basically, you have to find a sponsor. If someone can sponsor you, you can obviously you can work. So sponsor in sense like uh, he offers job offer, job job? offer. Any clinic need to give you a job that there is called a sponsor. If they give you a job, they will give you like, you know, um, the letter and then, then you can apply the work visa kind of thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. One more question for you. Uh, if you pass the written exam, uh, we have to move on for the clinical part. Okay. So clinical part is more of a hands-on skills we have to portray in the examination session. So what sort of uh, session you have for the clinical part? To so once we pass exam. this exam, then we uh, we will also provide you that, that coaching also. So we provide all these, uh, you know, first we launch part one, then we start part two. For example, earlier we start that CAPS, then um, NCLEX, AMC exam. So all those exams, we already started those part part two as well. But free therapy, once the student will pass, especially in this March exam, then we will start this clinical exam also but clinical in general is called OSCE exam OSC so they will see basically your skills there is several section stations is there you have to go there and perform certain tasks and the lecturer is observing you this is called clinical exam in Australia so we will provide the coaching after uh, some of the student pass from part one thank you thank you Yes, Kisi we or we can finish here. Yes, Pauline Kaur. How much how much PT score is required for yes, the English basically uh, whether you are a medical doctor, pharmacist, nurse, physiotherapist, any healthcare practitioner want to register in Australia, you need English score is the same for everyone. So you need IL six uh, that uh, seven individual band or sixty-five in PT or B uh, grade in OET. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, good afternoon, sir. That, that. Uh, sir, I just want to know that uh, how many attempts in a year are allowed to uh, take uh, the APC exam? The exam they conduct yearly four times, okay, and you can take as many times uh, this attempt. So each attempt you need to pay the fees to the government. That's it. Means means once in a quarter. Yes. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, if we give the APC exam, it will be, is it hard to pass the Not exam? Not very hard, you know, you just need to score 50%. If anyone have a, you know, very difficult time in this exam, I can say, you know, you guys are not study this, your bachelor degree, you know, seriously. So I have a doubt basically, you know, because there's a, uh, you can, in very simple words, they will give you 100 my MCQs. And you need to score at least 50% around, you know, so you need to pass the exam. This is not very tough, I can say. It's a mediocre exam. So what, uh, in, in, clinical, in clinical part, what is the scenario? Yeah, they will give some, uh, some case scenario that there will be some patient and you have to perform certain tasks. They will clear clinical exam. They will see your clinical skills. So, what is the syllabus, total syllabus, and is there any weightage for particular part like musculoskeletal? And yes, we have. This is, uh, uh, once you join academically, we only uh, give the lecture based on that only, you know. Uh, last 10 years question paper, based on we have our own syllabus. So, 
we know from where we ask more questions, so we will give you, you know, the more footage for that particular topic. And there are certain topics they are not giving, not asking many questions. For example, evidence-based medicine, EBM, you know, they hardly ask one question, sometimes zero question, you know. So we will not give much, much, you know, importance for that that topic, you know. So we know from where they will ask the question, then we accordingly, uh, we will prepare for you. So how many times they will conduct the exam, uh, like per year? Yearly four times. Month, in which month? Yearly four times, March, June, you know, September, December. How many months it will take so for the practice, like for training three months. and three months. Three months. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, Pavlin. Uh, sir, I want to know that if I come uh, in a spouse visa in Australia, uh, yeah. so I want to know the short, uh, the shortest course which I should opt for because I have to, uh, I have to prepare for APC as well. So, which uh, short course should I offer with APC preparation? There is there is no need to have any short course. You just need to pass this exam, and if you are on a spouse visa, most likely there is a chance for you to work in Australia. You know, as a husband, future peace simultaneously you are preparing. But if you want to study here any uh, like low co low cost course, so I can say you can come on like you know, maybe uh, Master of Public Health. Okay. Because I'm going to come to Australia uh, in a spouse visa, so I was which course. And there is no need. If you are coming on a spouse visa, you just need to prepare now and pass this part one. Once you land in Australia, just start looking a job because you already have a full work right to work in Australia. So you will get something uh, a job for you. Are you coming in which city? Uh, I have not yet decided, but uh, I'm deciding to. Uh, come in sydney i guess i have not yes. yet decided okay, okay i mean sydney is the highest jobs i can say it's sydney then melbourne these are the main cities in australia so if uh sir one more question so if we, uh, i come in a, a student visa which course should i opt like uh, healthcare or... MPH, mph you can take this is a uh i can say cheap and best course otherwise the course other courses very very high cost for example if you want to do yeah. master of physiotherapy the cost okay. might be around 50 lakh okay. and getting admission also is not easy in that course so i should mm -hmm. offer an uh, uh i can uh, do my uh, apc preparation also yes if you are coming on a spouse visa then no need to come on a study why you want to study a study you are stressing it means that you are uh, you are a man applicant your husband is going to be dependent on you yeah Okay, so so you are coming on a study visa, not a spouse yeah. visa. So if yeah. you study visa, in that case, you just apply for Master of Public Health and okay. pass this exam, and you can simultaneously part time you can work as a assistant physiotherapist. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, sir, after I completed my PC exam exam. Can I work as a physio under someone's situation? Can I help you? Can you please repeat or maybe, maybe you can type your question? Uh, so after I completed my PC exam, can I work as a physio under someone's situation? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yes, um, uh, are you able to work in or in, in someone uh, guidance, right? Someone separation. Yeah, yes. Sir. Yes, you can. Can you help me for that process also? We have help to everyone. This is not something for you or for any one student. So we have around two thousand student currently with us, medical doctor, oh. dentist, pharmacist. You know, so we provide assistance for everyone. Our job to you know help you guys to be uh, in Australia. You know. So we will help you in your CV, cover letter, what are the website need to apply in all those things, you know. So we are not an agency, we are not a job searching or something. We are a education company. We will provide our job to help you to clear the exam. Apart from the exam, we will also help you the, the give you the assistance for job searching and visa thing and all those things as well. Yeah. 
Yes, my Hello, question. Sir. Can you please unmute? Yes, Kirti. I, I have one, one more question. Like, how much GP is required for the APC exam? How much fees? GP, GP is or like yes, bachelor of physiotherapy. Just simple need to pass. Okay, okay. Thank if you. Someone sir. want to apply here, master of physiotherapy. In that case, you need minimum seventy percent mark in your bachelor degree to apply that course. But if you are applying for APC registration, you will just want to see your degree. You must complete it. That's it. Okay, okay, sir. Thank Whether you. Whether it is fifty percent your marks, maybe ninety percent marks, doesn't matter. Okay, okay. Hello, sir. Hello. I I wanted to ask that if one is HCPC registered, is there any other process or the APC exam is common for all? For getting license in Australia. Are you from which country? I am from India, but I've got my HCPC registration. HCPC, uh, where where it is? I mean, in in the Australia. UK. Yes, UK. So you are a uh, uh, registered uh, free therapist in UK. Yes. Are you on which visa in UK? No, I am in India right now. I applied for HCPC registration via international applicant, so I've got my registration. No, 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 no. Uh, again, you need to go for APC. Okay, okay. So APC there, is common for all in order to get licensed uh, physiotherapist uh, yes. in Australia. Yes, if you are fully working there, you know, and fully registered in UK, then mm -hmm. might be the another case for you. But if okay. you are in India, you just need to apply and you know, pass the exam. That's, okay. That cannot help you. Okay, okay. And what about the sponsored jobs in the Australia? Are they easily available or? Nothing is easy, you know. If it's that much easy, then everyone will be in here in Australia, right? Yeah, that's true. No. Uh, but uh, I can say a lot of free therapists are working currently from India only. In, in if you go to find uh, ten free therapy clinic in in Sydney, hmm. I'm hundred percent sure one third the free therapists from India only. Okay, okay. Yes, there is a lot of jobs basically. In a, even if you are uh, ready to work in the regional area, there is okay. a high chance to get a job. So don't keep you yourself to be you know like for example someone is saying that I am coming on Sydney only you know. Right. So, you just say that I'm ready to work anywhere. If they are no location you. preference. Yes, first for two to three years. Yes, after, yes. Uh, after that, you can move. You know wherever you want. If you want yes. to be, for example, in Sydney, or you want to go in Melbourne, wherever you want, you can. But initially, don't give any any preference. Don't give right. any preference. Right, right. If you okay. Keep it, then it will be you know very difficult. Yes. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, next please. Okay, quick question, guys. Please fill this form. So, time to time, we may share with you the information, some other information, some other country opportunity for you available uh, with us. So, please fill this form, or if you have any questions, also you can ask in this form. So, we will connect to you shortly. Okay. Hi. Sir, did the want any experience for writing APC exam? No work experience required. But if you have a work experience, that is good uh, for you. When you are looking a job, it may help you. But 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 the requirement is work experience not required. Uh, basically, Sir, in general, you... only lab technicians, if they want to migrate to Australia, they need two year work experience. Rest anyone like nurse, pharmacist. Physiotherapist, medical doctor, dentist does not require uh, any work experience to write this exam. Only lab technicians require two-year work experience in general. Okay, sir. So, if we fail in clinical exams, do we have to write uh, them first? No, no. If you fail, no, no. If you fail in clinical, again you need to give uh, uh, in clinical again. Don't. If we don't want to write again written exams. No, no. If you fail in clinics. No, no, no. For example, if you pass at an exam and if you fail in clinical, so you need to repeat clinical exam again. We don't want to write uh, written again, right? Yes. It written if you are not able to pass in three years. In three years, they are giving you a, a 12 chance. If you continuously okay. if you fail in 12 times and 13 times you want to give again, in that case, you need to again need to write this exam. But I don't think so. Okay, that much long for you or anyone basically in general. Definitely you will pass. Okay. You know? 
Uh, but in general, if you are, you know, if you are giving fail in one time, second time you can go, third time you can go. Uh, sir, what is the first step for uh, for HUC? This is for basically we can we, say document verification with a uh, Austrian Free Therapy Council. This, this is the first step uh, for, for uh, submitting all our documentation. This is the first step. Yeah, this, yes. This is called then the second step is, Okay, then the second step is uh, written assessment, right? Yes. Then English. So, then again, uh, that uh, part to clinical. Okay, uh, if we fail uh, return, do we want to again register the first step? Do it the first step? No, I'm saying no. No, no, you just need to. Why you are If you have that much doubt in your mind, you fail in part two, then definitely you cannot clear the exam. Don't take risk, basically. You know, if you are confident, okay. then, then come for any exam. Basically, it is not in general. You know, if you keep in your mind, you will fail, fail, fail. You are asking again, again. In general, student pass is like seventy percent student pass. This is not an exam like IES or PCS, like. 1000 students are given this exam and one only pass. So the passing rate is very high for these exams. They just want to know your knowledge only. They want to check. This exam is not very okay. tough exam. Okay, so thank you. Always, basically, you know, then only you can clear any exam, I can say, in general. Yes, guys, any other question, Kizika? Okay, please uh, fill this form in the chat box we are giving. And uh, if you have any questions, you can ask in that in, in, in the form and we will correct you. Okay, so we can finish here. And uh, time to time, we conduct this kind of, you know, um, this master classes. So if you next time also, if you want to attend, we will, uh, we will send you the email. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Randa. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.